Welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Holly Cardozo. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Um, our topic is ABCs, the ABCs of Medical Device Single Audit Program, or MDSAP as it's commonly referred. I'm joined today by our presenter, Zahair. He's a medical device technical manager and global scheme owner with SI Global. Um, a wealth of information. I'm very pleased to welcome him today. And with that, I'll kick it over to you. Thank you, Holly, and uh, thank you for all those who uh, took from their schedule to take time to attend this uh, webinar. Uh, the the MDSAP, I believe most of you have heard about it, and it goes back uh, to 2000, even 12, not 2014. The pilot program started in 2014, and it had passed through different phases, phases until now it's uh, live. So we will go and cover some of the essential points about the MDSAP. The three main topics that will be covered today is how to define the scope of the audit. We are getting clients that say that I only would like to get MDSAP for Canada, and we're saying no. The MDSAP is not defined like that, so we will go and cover the rules which defines which countries should be included in an MDSAP audit and the definition and the relation between a certificate, what's the value of a certificate, and what's the value of the audit report for very different countries. What are the key documents you need to be prepared for an MDSAP audit? And then we will see that if there's always opportunities that if you get an MDSAP with a mindset only to address Canada or the FDA, that in the near future also you can add the, the, the remaining countries participating in MDSAP. So my name is Zahar Harbuti as Holy uh, Presented. I'm the technical manager. Uh, every six months I attend with the other with the other auditing organizations, uh, the MDSAP forums. So in these forums, uh, we meet with the five regulators from the five countries. They share with us their input, their the feedback from the manufacturers. We do mutually exchange similar information in the sense how we can optimize and make this uh, experience for the manufacturers as much as better. Uh, I have my resume here there. Well, I have uh, more than 10 years of experience in auditing and uh, for different kinds of standards. So, uh, to start, where can we get the information? Uh, again, I'm repeating, it might be redundant. Uh, maybe most of you already know this information, but for those who don't, simply go to any Google browser, put MDSAP FDA, and the first hit is going to be, uh, it will direct you to this link. So, today, the MDSAP is hosted on the FDA website. There's no main reason other than the FDA is to, they have an amazing infrastructure, it's, it's secure, nobody can uh, interfere with the, the information that is available on that. And temporarily, even though it's 2014 now, temporarily is hosted on the FDA website, and this app consortium is working on an alternative platform that will migrate all this information to the MDC. But at, at this, as of this moment, this is a, uh, a, a preprint screen of the current status of the MDC page. So when you hit this page, Yes, there's a lot of information, but how can you navigate and work, uh, go through it? So here, at this bottom, the one is highlighted now, it's going to guide you to the MDSAP documents, where you get all, all the information you need in preparation for the MDSAP, especially the ones that I'm going to share with you today. A background before we start hitting our three topics. Today, the five countries participating in the MDSAP are Canada, FDA, and Brazil at the current continent here, and then on the other side of the world, we have Japan and Australia. And what you are seeing here in the district, so you are trying to uh, make you see that it's all based on the standard 1545. So sometimes clients are confused and accept it's different than 1545 or not. No, the core of the medical device single audit program initially was based on the older version of the standard 1545-2003, but now, as of February 28, 2019, we are not talking about the old standard, so everything now is based on the new version of the standard. Uh, how did the, start, the, the story start? For those who are familiar with the candy cans, so Health Canada developed a model years ago where they thought of the idea of outsourcing, not the inspection per se, but the quality management system. And they developed a model in a way that they have full confidence in the standard, but they still said, well, you know what, there's a gap. And 
they developed a program called the Gandhi Gas, where they shared this is the gap that auditors need to cover on top of the standard. So Health Canada conducted training for the auditors. They attended witness audits. They were also participating with the SEC accreditation to make sure that all recognized organizations to do on their behalf those audits are adhering to the requirements. So at that time, in total, there were 13 recognized certification bodies that were issuing candy gas certificates. Now, what they were doing that, what did the other four countries were doing? Now, FDA, on the other hand, they have their existing model today that they are still using adjacently with the MSA. So the FDA, they send their inspectors out to do inspections, but now due to lack of resources, the booming of the medical device industry, the FDA is not capable today to keep up following their schedule on a yearly basis, conducting all those inspections. Same thing for the other countries that are shown in here, for Japan, Brazil, and Australia. So here they said, why don't we go and follow up the Canadian model? And to do that, they said, well, let's participate. Today, it's not mandatory to do NDSA for any of the four countries. So the four, sorry, the four countries I'm talking about here are, for Canada, it's mandatory today to get your license and to renew your license. You need an NDSA certificate. For the US and the other three countries, it's not mandatory. But if you are selling to Canada and selling to the US, it becomes mandatory for both of those two countries. So I'll go more about the scoping in the second topic, but this is just the preparation. So these countries, they said, why don't we follow the, the, health, the, the health Canada model? And by doing what? They grabbed that standard, the ISO, they identified the gap with the regulatory requirements. No, for, for most of those North American uh, manufacturers, they will need translators to go over the Japanese or the Portuguese requirements. So those countries, they already did all the translations, they identified the gaps, and they have placed those gaps in the information available today that we call audit model and companion document that I will be covering. So uh, it was a big step for those four countries. Today, they have both recognition or licensing of devices, either the existing model, which is through inspections, so TGA, uh, FDA, and Visa, or uh, the Japan, the MDHWL, they can come and do their inspections to issue licenses for those facilities that are interested in licensing and selling their products in those countries, or by simply presenting the MDSAP certificate slash MDSAP report. So the current status today is that these are the five countries. There are other regulators are interested to join the consortium due to the challenges today that auditing organizations such as Site Global and the other participating or competitors in the market we are facing in training auditors and delivering and matching the, the, the benchmark of acceptance of those reports for those five countries. They said, let's limit it until we get more information about how these auditing organizations, and when I say auditing organizations, is an alternative to a notified body, alternative to a certification body, but that's the term that is used by the NDSA. So in this presentation also, we are sharing right the, the links, direct links to the NDSA page and the Health Canada uh, NDSA uh, webpage. So the first topic on our agenda was that, how do we define the NDSA scope? So after you press the NDSA documents, as I've said in my previous slides, you will hit this second page. Now on this page, the first item you have, it says questions and answers on medical device of the program. Now, yes, the revision goes back to 2017. This is the most updated one. What the NDSA consortium did since 2014, since the initiation of this program, they said they reconciled and compiled all the questions that originated from regulators, from manufacturers, from auditors, from auditing organizations, all the information, that the questions that they received, they compiled it in this document and they said, okay, let's put everything there so that the recurrent and the most frequent questions are asked, the manufacturers can go and access to get their, their answers from there. 
so since we're talking about how to define the scope, so under question 16 of that document, there was, it says, what is the best way to determine what is expecting of an order uh, organizations with regard to multiple jurisdictions? So the scope here actually is defined by the auditing organizations against, like by site Global and other competitors. How? When we go and see that if you are selling a product, class two, depending if it needs regulations or not, but let's take it, class two, class three, class four, you are selling that to Canada and you are selling it to the US and you are asking to have MDSA only for the Canadian requirements, the auditors cannot accept that. The auditors will right away expand the scope of the, of the audit. And now the FDA or the US requirements are now mandatory and they will fall under the scope of the audit. So the answer here says medical device manufacturers will have to be audited according to the scope declared in their application and based on the countries where the manufacturers sells or intends to sell. So of the one page you are saying, well, we're selling to Australia, but you say, well, you know what? We don't, we haven't sold any product yet to Australia, but it's just for marketing. So this is more of an intent. We don't want to have a false claim. So yes, definitely you have to make sure, but this is what are the tools that the auditors go and double check when they are conducting their anti staff audits. If you have devices that are registered, based on that APO, which means auditing organization against site Global or the other competitors, will determine the regulatory requirements applicable to that manufacturer. Now, the AOs, which means our auditors, they will need to consult audit model and companion document. This is something that I will touch base in the following slides. Now, uh, just to also bring up another question, which it's a lot of recurrent and we see a lot of inquiries about, is about DUNS numbers. So I'm not going to go into details, but under question 94, when you are asking for a code for an anti-SAP, one of the questions that we need before we can proceed with the contracting process, preparing for the audit, sending out the auditor, is the DUNS number. Now, the, to go into the steps and this understand how to achieve it's all covered under the question. So back to our topic, which is how to define the scope of the audit. So when we see in the middle, the anti sap audit, actually we are looking at two outputs. We're looking at an output, which most of you are familiar with, which is we need a QMS focus, which is to deliver an anti sap certificate. And well, actually this is true only when we are auditing for Canada and Australia. But when we are covering also the FDA, for example, then we are looking at a site focus. What is the difference between QMS focus and site focus? If I take, for example, company X, today they are based, let's say, in the US, and they want to bring their product to Canada, and maybe it's already in Canada for 10 years, and nothing changed to that product, and when they come to us, they say, well, okay, we are switching now from CandyCast to Ambisap. What do we need? What are the audit durations? So when we go and start preparing our audit, we see what the scope statement on the certificate. And let's take an example. The line of manufacturing is three products, three families. I will call them A, B, and C. Only A is sold to Canada. So this is what they want on the certificate. On the empty sab when we go and start conducting the audit, we cannot neglect or ignore products B and C. Just as a reminder, the manufacturer is they have three line of products. It's A, B, C. Only A is to be licensed in Canada. Under Andy Sap, we look at all the products, including those that are not falling under the certification of Andy Sap. Why? Remember, our auditors today they are changing their head from an auditor to a regulatory auditor which means that they are doing an inspection on behalf of the FDA. Your information on the FDA website already identifies and lists all the activities per site or the products manufactured per site. And based on that, we need to continue the same story that you have already notified the FDA years ago. So when our auditor goes to, to, to do the anti self audit, they need to continue the same story of the FDA. Well, it says that on this side they have A, B, and C, so the auditor might have a different sampling depending on a lot of different criteria, but he needs to identify these are ABCs, if they're the ABC products. Now, 
if there were any inspections done in the F with the FDA in the past three, four years, and there was like a warning letter issued, the auditors will need to go and verify the effectiveness of the actions taken for those who, uh, warnings that were issued. So this is in a nutshell where I know it's a complicated topic and this might raise a lot of questions. Uh, when we are sending the auditors, they are changing their heads five times. They are auditing against the Canadian requirements on top of the standard. Same thing for the Australian requirements, the US requirements, Japan, and, and Visa for the Brazilian requirements. So changing these heads and, switch, uh, and switching them from one country to another is not an easy process. The requirements are different for each country, but they are all spelled out in the audit model and in the companion document. So the second step when we are defining the scope of the audit is what are the audit durations? And again, it's in the same same web page. So remember, we pressed from the main page and these set of documents. In the previous slide, I shared the questions and answer. Now we're going to go over the audit time procedures. So all the NDSAP information and procedures are available online. They are accessible to auditors and to manufacturers. And when we are using this procedure, we can go and see why we are using specific audit durations. You can challenge them. You can say, no, the procedure says this, not that. So there's nothing hidden. It's in full transfer transparency. So from here, when we go to audit procedures and forms, you will come to this another page. And this page is quite huge. So I only took an extract. The reason I took an extract is to share with you the audit duration procedure and the, the Excel file that we use to fill up. And this is a tool that we need also to provide to the NDSAP. So just taking an extract about auto duration to share with you how is it defined and structured. So this table, I will not go into a lot of details in it. To make it as simple as possible, when we look at the NDSAP processes, for those that are familiar with the NDSAP program, you are looking here at seven chapters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, management, device uh, marketing authorization, um, uh, management analysis, medical device adverse events, design development. We were talking about production and purchasing. So what the NDSAT did, they took the standard 1345, 2016, and then they sorted it out in a way that it fulfills these seven identified chapters. Now, for each chapter, they have identified a specific number of tasks, and they expect that for each task to spend a specific amount of time. This is how, when we identify which tasks are applicable, which tasks are not applicable, like if you don't do servicing, you don't do installation, you don't have any sterilized product, all of those tasks will be turned to zero. So if you go to production, when we say no servicing, no installation, no sterilization, no software in the product. So here we're talking about four tasks, which means four times 35. So here we're taking out uh, 35 times four, which is about two hours out of the total audit durations. Now, if you are selling to additional countries, which means that the auditors, they need to go and verify the licensing and all this information, then the, for those individual countries, it will be incremented. So if we have Canada and the US, so you're looking, not looking at three, you are looking at six. So instead of one hour and a half only for the US, you're looking one hour and a half for the US and one hour and a half of the Canadian. So anyway, the table here, it goes down all the way to break it down to say how many days are needed for this audit. But we use this table and it's a better presentation when you go over this green line, the green box, sorry, where you have the calculation tool. So after hitting this topic, which is a scope, how to prepare for the MDSAP? What are the tools that are needed? Now, even if you have already passed the MDSAP audit, you received your certificate, still the, the exercise, uh, this program is, is living. There were a few corrections that were released in the past few weeks from the MDSAP, which means that the auditors, they will go and go and verify this information when they do their following audits. Now, again, this information is important that you keep up to date we are checking their website and seeing the most recent information. So it's the same hit or the same web page we were talking about. We were talking about the audit determination procedure and calculation form, but now I'm going to go and talk about 
these two documents. So I don't know, the first uh, on the top of the screen. This one is the audit model. And this one is the companion document. Now, audit model, it has the requirements. Companion documents, it has explanations on how to audit those requirements. So the companion document has more comprehensive information. To go one step backward, the MDSAP consortium expects to have a harmonized audit. An auditor in Taiwan and is expected to perform the MDSAP audit in the same way an auditor in Canada is going to conduct the audit. In writing out an audit plan, it has to fit the same criteria. Same duration should be applied, even for a different manufacturer. The questions that are asked during the audit, the expectations are always the same. So that's how it's structured. So for those who are also aware of this uh, flowchart of the MDSAP, we are talking again here about the seven chapters that I presented in the audit duration. So we start with the management. The auditors should start auditing the management. Here we are talking about 11 tasks under the management. Each task should take 28 minutes. In parallel, the auditors are expected to cover the device marketing authorization facility. Now, the auditors cannot go and do design before management. This order has to be respected and followed. Under 1345, under candy cats, the auditors would send out an audit plan and the opening meeting would say, well, you know what? The audit plan is flexible. We can move things around as you expect, as you want. Well, we don't have the same flexibility under the empty side. So if, let's say, you are expected to have an audit, four days audit or this five days audit on the side, and it just happens that production is going to be on the Thursday, but on Thursday you go to production. This is, needs to be anticipated in advance. Normally, the auditors doing stage one would catch it up, but this also will help you identify and understand that once you are in this program, the flexibility with the audit plan is not that available. The next process or chapter that needs to be covered after management of device marketing authorization is to go to measurement analysis improvement and medical device advancements. So these tasks are also done uh, in parallel. And then after that, we go to the design development. Now, even though this is, might seem redundant, but there's a lot of information that when you have a design change, it will go and double check. Did you notify the regulators? Is this a significant change? Yes or no? If yes, what have you done? If no, where are the, document, the, uh, the documentation and the records that shows that these are not significant changes and we didn't need to notify? the regulators. So let's take an example. You have a product in Japan, go to Japan. Does it mean that you need to notify the Japanese uh, regulation? No, you notify the marketing authorization holder in Japan. So your duty and obligation is to notify that person of that, that office. And they, in return, they have to go and notify the uh, Japanese regulations. So after that, we have the production and service controls. And purchasing is going to be uh, going to collect information of all of those processes. Now, I know it's not easy in five minutes, or maybe even less than two minutes, to explain this whole process, but there's a lot of, um, uh, how to say, there's a lot of, <clears throat> uh, from the, the MDSAP consortium, there's a lot of experience, there's a lot of input over the years from the inspections on how they came up with the exact process flow and how much time needs to be allocated for each task. So what I have done here is I selected just one example from the companion document, which is task number five from management. When you look at it, you have this question, and I'm, going, I'm not going to go into details and how to prepare for that specific task and how it's to be addressed. But I'm talking here about why and how to use this document. So, you have the task, the expectations that the auditors, they go and they ask the question about the extent of outsourcing. Now, when they ask this question, they would have already covered the requirements of 1345, 2016, and the closes 415, 421. So, which means that by asking these questions, they already, the auditors already hit two clauses of the standard. Now, also, when the regulators, they did their homework and they compared it, TG, which means that the TGA, they found that this question already covered this requirement from Schedule 3 of the requirement, 
but there is also an additional requirement on top of that. So the auditor will ask, and again, if you are selling or intend to sell, or if you have registered product in Australia, if you don't have any of that related to Australia, you don't have to worry about that. So if you are selling to Australia, then the auditor will have a follow-up question to say and ask you and see if you are complying with this additional requirement. So here I try to use these colors to make you identify where I'm talking. So for the ones in blue are the Anvisa. So you don't see that there is any additional requirements for Anvisa, so you're good if you are fulfilling this outsourcing process. And then the last one is the Japanese, the MHLW. You see that also you are fulfilling this one. And I think here I have a type code. So the 21 CFR is the FDA actually. So this is two regulators, Japan and the FDA. And last but not least, here you have the Canadian requirements. So if you're selling to Canada, yes, the auditor will ask this. Even if you are selling to the US, the auditor doesn't have additional questions to ask, but will have this additional one for Canada. Now, under the companion document, you are seeing here at the far bottom, assessing conformity. And this is where we are training our auditors how to ask the questions and what to really look for when you are showing them those records. Now, I will not also go in details. We have another webinar scheduled for next week. We are going to go over the tools that are used with our auditors. But the point here and to capture is that the assessing conformity, it has a lot of importance in the companion documents. In total, there are more than 75 pointers in the companion documents that is telling the auditors exactly how to audit these tasks. Why? My interpretation, if I only read this three, two, two and, a, two and a half statement, two and a half line statement, I might have an interpretation different from another person in another country. So another auditor, I mean. So to make sure that you are all auditing in the same way, yes, they have this statement, but to avoid any gray areas or misinterpretation, they have added the exact requirement under the assessing conformity. So if you check the companion document, you will see that there are pages and pages that explains how this needs to be opened. The last point I would like to cover under this section is that the non-conformity. And the non-conformity structure used today in the MDSAP does not follow what the industry is used to by using minor non-conformity or major non-conformity. It all goes down to the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, which is the requirements for medical device auditing organizations, sorry, non-conformity grading system for regulatory purposes, which is this document. So here I'm showing, I'm pointing out the sources of the information, where is it coming from? Grading non-conformities under the MDSAT, it has a very uh, structured way. So it goes, once the auditor identifies a non-conformity, they need to go to a final grade. And to go and find this grade, it goes, has to go from step one to step two. So I'm going to jump to the next slide. And as you can see here, we're looking at the matrix where we have grade one, then we have grade two, then grade three, then grade four. So the first step is to identify what is the starting point? It all goes back of how the standard 1345 is written. So if a non-conformity is raised against, here I have it already in these notes, if any NCR is going to be raised against the close between 4.1 and 6.3, then this sorry, then this means it is indirect and the starting point is going to be grade one. Now, if the non-conformity is going to be starting from 6.4 to 8.5, this means that this non-conformity has a direct impact on the manufacturer of medical device, and the starting point is going to be grade three. So again, we have indirect from 4.1 to 6.3, and then direct from 6.4 to 8.5. Now, if the auditor, they are raising a non-conformity, and you see that you had the same exact problem in the past two years, and they will say it's repeat, and now it's going to be bumped 
a higher grade and it will go to grade two. So step one is to see if it's direct or indirect and to verify if there was any repeat incident from the past two years, not only from the past year. The next is to go to step two, which is the escalation rules. And the escalation rules are as per the following. Is there any absence of a documented process or procedure? Now, shouldn't you address this, like when you are preparing for all of the anti-SAT thing, and if it's like a lack of, of a word or the procedure is not clear, but the procedure is there, then it's okay. But if the expectations is to have a procedure for analysis of data and you don't have it, and it's crucial information that the whole measurement and analysis process is based on the analysis of data, then here the auditors can raise it to another one. So let's say, let's take the extreme scenario. We started with grade three because it was a nonconformity uh, against, let's say, anywhere close in the 7.3, and then it was a repeat, so it went to four, and now when we go to the escalation because there was no procedure there, then here we are going to grade five, even though you are not seeing grade five in this matters, but we have a grade still grade five, and this also meant that there was a medical, there's an evidence that a medical device that was released to the market, if that's the case, then it will go to grade six. So the anti subset, the maximum you can have is grade five. So from what I'm saying here, you have to look at, at, the, at the grading of non-conformities. You have grade one, two, three, they are, they are serious, they are but at the same time like minor non-conformities, but anything from four and five, then this is more serious and it's going to fall under the majors. Now, uh, next week I will go more in details about non-conformities and how the auditors and what they will do in, in closing those non-conformities. Auditors who have, uh, sorry, manufacturers who have more than two grade fours, so not two, let's say three and above grade fours, this might make an alert, it will red flag to the regulators. If a manufacturer has one grade five only, it will trigger the same flag to the regulators. Now, as a consequence, this means it requires a very close follow-up and they need to see what are the actions taken by the manufacturers. The last part on our agenda is how to maximize your investment. So, Today we are living in a, in, a, in, a big world, in a small world where everything is reachable. Like if you have an advertisement to sell in Canada, you can say, well, okay, everything is working now in Canada. I'm already paying for an MPSAP audit. I already drained my resources to prepare for this uh, program. Why I can also add the FDA. Now, it all depends on the market business plan, if there's a need for your product over there or not. Now, there, what I'm trying to say here, yes, it's doable. If you're, even if your focus is only to say, I want to sell in Canada and I want to get this license now, active with Health Canada to sell my products here, but you can extend the scope and add the FDA requirements. And once you go to the and start investing time in the companion document, and identifying what are the additional requirements, you can make a develop a plan on a gap. What are the additional work and resources that I need to invest in to get this product and have it qualified by the FDA? Now, why is that? Even though the FDA is not mandating MDSAT, the FDA, they need to do inspections, as I've said at the beginning of this presentation. Now, when they see that you are now in the MDSAT program, the FDA will not conduct inspection. So, and it happened a lot last year when we had already planned clients to proceed with the MDSAM. And those clients were approached by FDA saying that by Friday afternoon, they called the client saying Monday will be at your facility to conduct our inspection. Manufacturer reached out to us and we right away communicated with the FDA and told them, this client is ours, they are MDSAP, so at that point the FDA will back off unless they have legal suspicions, whatever it is, for going and doing their inspections, then they are they will not conduct the inspections. 
So you will also fulfill those requirements and you can, so it's an added value, even if it's not mandatory, once you go into the NDSAP, then you don't have to worry about the FDA inspections. Now the same applies to the other countries. If I take, for example, M visa, M visa around 2016, they had the waiting time before a new manufacturing facility received the GMP certificate to wait around four years. So any manufacturer who wants to bring their product to, uh, to, to, uh, to Brazil, they need to get a GMP certificate of their building and then they need to get the license for their medical device. But they cannot do that because the visa officers that do inspections, it will take them years and years before they can proceed with that. Now, when they started with this MDSAP as an alternative model, they said now the current timeline is about six months. So because they are using only the audit report that is issued by the auditing organization, the MVSA will, again, will not look at the MDSAP certificate, will take only into consideration the report, and based on that, your product can go into that market. So to sum up from this presentation, even if today you focus and I believe that's why you are attending this webinar. Only have Canada to get your license. Maybe you can do it as a first step, but to add any of the other countries, it doesn't mean that you have to pay side Global or other our competitors for a complete stage two, where we have to see that you are fulfilling and complying with all of the companion documents. No, it's going to be a special focus audit, which will only focus on the additional requirements that are written in the companion document or in the audit model. And once this is special focus audit, it can be done alone, standalone. It can be done during a surveillance audit already planned where we will add whatever necessary time. It can be maybe for one country, it can go up to six hours on top of the surveillance audit to cover the regulation, the regulators of the other countries for uh, to, to have a complete and sub report that fulfills all the requirements of the five countries. Uh, from ex our experience so far, we wanted to share it with you. Uh, due to the revisions uh, of, of the NDSAP model and the companion document, uh, I, I really encourage that you go and double check if you passed the NDSAP model last year or the year before. Are you today using the same revisions of the documents. If not, develop a gap. If this is the first time, develop a gap. Identify in this gap what are you, uh, what are you already in your procedures, your quality manual, what are you addressing, so where do you fulfill this requirement? If there's a requirement for a quality plan, do you have a quality plan? I'm talking about the close 5.1, which is under also under management in the NDSAP, are you fulfilling the requirements of the quality plan? If yes, good. If not, identify what needs to be added. The auditors will be doing that. Your key point to, to, to work around, or to understand the gap, is again to go over the assessing conformity. So, sorry for repeating it, but that's why it's a red. It's, it's, it's very important to go over that point. Uh, don't be surprised because now I believe we covered the scope statement or the scope of the audit, is if it's a certificate or is it a scope uh, or, or is it a site? So uh, so auditors, when they come and they say, well, today we're going to be selecting a sample from product B, remember company X, so we're going now to expand this, not expand. Now we are also covering product B and you say, well, you know what? No, I was preparing myself because my certificate for Health Canada that I would like to submit is only for a product A. You cannot do that. If the auditor has the reasons, then they can select product B. So no surprises there. So make sure that when you are preparing for your MDSAP audits, that the audit can, the auditor can select any of those that are manufactured their facility depending on the regulate uh, the, the the markets that you are selling your products. Uh, the last point I would like to cover here is the NCRs. What is the timeline for an NDSAP NCR? To avoid the, uh, the surprises, uh, today for most of our clients that are, were used to camp gas, they were used to the minor major non-conformities from 30 days to 60 days. This is all this different on the NDSAP. So the timeline for an NCR 
for any grade from grade one to grade five, the expectations is that we, the auditor, expects to receive from the manufacturer within 15 working days the root cause, sorry, 15 days, not the working days, within 15 days the root cause, the corrections, and the corrective actions. Now, if there were grade four or grade five, then on top of these 15 days, there's another 15 days to see the, uh, the objective evidence of the corrective action, the implementations. So you were talking that within 30 days after the end of the audit, the auditors are expected to write down all the rationale, accepting or not accepting, or while providing additional uh, extensions to those NCRs. So to recap for these two points, Grade one, two, three, four, five. Within 15 days, we need all of this information. For only grade four and grade five, we need 15 days on top of the 15 days, so in a total of 30 days, we need the objective evidence of the implementations. I know this is all different than what you are used to, but this is, these are all written in the NTSA uh, uh, <clears throat> information on the, on the website. So thank you for attending. I hope I didn't offer, go beyond the allowable time. Thank you very much, Sahir. Really good presentation. If you want to just put up that Q&A slide, um, I'm going to share a link to our follow-up presentation here for next week. So in case folks want to attend, they can um, join us next week as well. I got a few questions actually along the way, but I answered most of them. So I'll leave folks just a second here to see if they have any follow-up questions, but I think we might be able to close off for today. Um, so I'll leave it a second here, but um, while I'm doing that, I just want to thank you, Zahir, for your presentation, and thanks to everyone for your attendance. Uh, as noted, we'll share the link to the recording as well as the slide deck within a few business days. Um, looks like we're all in the clear. So thank you very much, Zahir. Have everyone uh, a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.